This is the 10% Happier Podcast. I'm Dan Harris. Hey, everybody. It's winter. It's dark out. And it's been uh, dark inside my head at uh, many times over these past few months. I've personally struggled with depression since I was a kid whose parents sent them to a shrink a bunch of times. And winter can often be tricky for me. If you've had similar experiences, you're in luck because we've got one of the world's leading experts in both depression and in how meditation can help. Sona Demijin is a professor in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of Colorado Boulder. She's a close colleague of Zindel Siegel, who was on the show ways back. That was an extremely popular episode, as I suspect this will be. In this conversation, we cover seasonal impacts on depression, the research on how meditation can help depression generally, and what she calls your behavioral antidepressants, which is a fascinating subject. She'll go into that in a pretty deep way. As you're about to hear, uh, Sona is low-key in her presentation, but she is truly a ninja when it comes to the science around this extremely common mental health challenge. Heads up on a few issues. There are a number of references to suicide in this conversation, just so you know. And on a much lighter note, you're going to hear Sona make a quick reference to the 30 seconds of silence at the start of the interview, which is a quick break we take before we start the interview and in that quick break, we record what is called room tone. This is a technical thing I've never understood, but I, I do use it as a time to quickly meditate before I start firing questions. And so I just didn't want you to be confused when you heard her reference to it. One more thing before we dive in. We are launching a new podcast. We've actually launched it already. One of the most intense, important, and astonishingly difficult things that has ever happened in my life is having a child. I think this is true for many of us who have kids. Parenting can be one of, if not the most transformative events of a lifetime. And while there are all sorts of resources out there for helping you do a better job as a parent, there aren't many shows about how to take care of yourself as a parent. We here at 10% Happier have now made that show. It's called Child Proof, and it's available now. It's hosted by an amazing person named Yasmin Khan, a recovering news reporter and mom of two young children. On the show, she tackles big questions, such as how do parents take care of ourselves while taking care of our kids? How do we not lose our crap with our children? How do we give ourselves a break? How do we not pass on our own various forms of dysfunction to our kids? Childproof is available now for free wherever you listen to your podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and for 10% Happier app subscribers, inside the app, ad-free. Check it out today. Okay, we'll get started with Sona Demijin right after this. Before we get started with today's episode, a brief word about the very fun topic of anxiety. If you're dealing with anxiety, you're in good company. That is, if you consider me good company. The bad news is that anxiety is unlikely to disappear overnight, but the good news is that you can change your relationship to it. I've seen this play out in my own life over and over again. And this is why we over on the 10% Happier app are relaunching one of our most popular meditation challenges ever. It's called the Taming Anxiety Challenge. It starts on February 6th. In this challenge, you'll hear meditation teacher Leslie Booker and Harvard Medical School Associate Professor Dr. Luana Marquez provide many, many strategies for dealing with anxiety. You'll get videos and meditations specifically designed to help you tame your anxiety, as well as daily meditation reminders to help keep you on track. To join the challenge, just download the 10% Happier app today, wherever you get your apps, or by visiting 10percent.com, all one word spelled out. If you already have the app, just open it up and follow the instructions to join. Okay, now on with the show. It's cool when a company that uh, my family and I already use asks to be an advertiser on this show. So I was excited when Instacart said they wanted to sponsor 10% Happier because we use it all the time. I recently used it to order ingredients for the smoothie I make every day that feeds me and my wife Bianca for lunch. If you want to know the ingredients, it's uh, frozen fruits, banana, almond butter, almond milk, some oats, and Greek yogurt. Super delicious, very healthy. Anyway, Instacart is the leading online grocery platform in North America. And with Instacart, the world is your cart. Fast and flexible delivery in as fast as an hour, or you can order ahead and select a delivery window 
that works for you. And it's not just groceries. Instacart can also deliver household essentials, pet items, important in our house with three demonic kittens, uh, beauty products, electronics, and more. Get free delivery when you cart your first order on the Instacart app and instacart.com. Offer valid for a limited time. Minimum order $10. Additional terms apply. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre. From bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries and thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, and more. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from the entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. The Audible app makes it easy to listen anytime, anywhere, while traveling, working out, walking, doing chores. I'm currently listening to Sea of Tranquility by Emily St. John Mandel. I loved her previous novel, Station Eleven, and couldn't wait to dive into this new one. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash 10% or text 10% to 500-500. That's audible.com slash T-E-N percent or text T-E-N percent to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Audible.com slash 10%. Sona Dimidjian, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Dan. It's wonderful to be here. Great to see you again. It's winter. It's getting dark. I can see that impacting my mood a little bit. Is that in my head or is there any link between the seasons and depression or the blues? Yeah, that's a great question. There is a link. For some people, their experience of depression is actually quite directly influenced by seasonal shifts. For other people, depression is something that they contend with throughout the year. And for some people, in a waxing and waning manner throughout their lives. And so... There are a lot of things that happen at this time of year. You noted the the change in our access to light, which itself can have a powerful impact on people's biological rhythms. It also can disrupt routines in daily life that can also have an important impact on how people feel. And then this is also a time of holidays, which can bring great joy for many people and can also bring stress and challenge too. So there's a lot going on. And if you notice ways in which that is impacting how you're feeling emotionally and physically, you're not alone in that. Are there techniques for remediating this? In particular, I sometimes hear people recommend getting a light box or be somehow getting more you know, sunlight, either naturally or artificially. Mm-hmm. Do you endorse that kind of approach? So when we think about depression, you know, it's this really broad category. And there are lots of different ways in which depression shows up in people's lives. For some people, light boxes and ways of addressing directly their circadian rhythms and the connection between mood can be extremely helpful. As you know, a lot of the work that I have done has focused on ways in which people can learn to work with sort of the habits and the patterns of their mind in a way that can help protect people from the experience of depression. And particularly for people who have experienced depression in the past, whether or not that's connected in seasonal patterns and changes, or more generally, we have learned over the past many years that people have the capacity to learn skills that can be quite powerful in terms of protecting them from the intensity of depression and from depression's return. When you talk about habits of mind, what do you mean? Yeah, it's a great question. So when we think about What are the ways in which people can get stuck in episodes of depression? And there's a large body of research that looks at what are the differences between people, for example, who have experienced depression in their lives and people who haven't. 
And some of this research points to the idea that there are two kinds of processes that happen in the ways in which we experience thoughts and emotions and situations in our lives that have focused on one process that is called rumination, which is the tendency to elaborate, to tell stories, to engage in this kind of mental narrative mode. So that's one piece. The other piece is this process of what's been called fixation, which is the tendency to like dwell on the negative. So when you get these two together, you can probably imagine the ways in which that can create vulnerability. So that People who have experienced depression, there's evidence that they have a greater likelihood of orienting to the negative and getting caught there by these patterns of rumination or elaborating, and that these processes can predict the likelihood that people will experience relapse of depression. What's helpful about knowing this is that it actually helps to focus our efforts on what are skills that people can learn that can counter the risk of getting pulled into either of these processes. So what are ways in which we can learn to intentionally bring awareness to the full range of experiences in our lives and to notice when we're getting caught in the negative And then what are ways that we can, rather than getting caught by thoughts and tending to add to them in a way, we can notice thoughts as thoughts or sensations or emotions as sensations or emotions and have this capacity to step back from them in a process that researchers have called decentering which is that capacity to step back and to see or to develop a kind of meta-awareness, to hold thoughts, metaphors people often use, like clouds passing in the sky or leaves floating along a stream, rather than getting pulled into the weather pattern or pulled down the stream so that within minutes you might have traveled miles away from where you started without even realizing it. I have a million questions. Can one experience fixation and or rumination without being depressed? Oh, yeah. So a lot of the studies that have been done actually are with people who have been depressed in the past and are not necessarily experiencing depression in the moment. But what can happen is that in the presence of some kind of challenge, so in research studies, sometimes people will be asked to listen to sad music or watch a sad movie that tend to elicit the kinds of emotions just in response to everyday events. And so these kinds of patterns can be present even when we're not experiencing an episode of depression. And so that's where, for me in the work that I've done, the practice of mindfulness can be so powerful because this is a practice that we can build into our lives on a daily basis. That in a sense, we are strengthening these alternative ways of engaging with difficulties that then are available to us in times when we may be at risk for falling back into a time of depression. You know, sometimes when I share these kinds of research findings with people, the initial response is like, well, can we just like not have those challenges? Like we could just avoid all the sad movies and not listen to sad music and won't that sort of take care of the problem? And I think there are two responses to that. One is like the capacity to experience sadness or fear. Some of these basic emotions is also part of what makes us human. And so if we did have a magic wand, would we really want to wave all that away? And then the second is that It's also really important to take action in the context of our lives that help to reduce stress and the ways in which stressors disproportionately affect individuals or groups of people. 
And that's not the world that we have right now, one that is completely free of challenges, stress, adversity. So given that, these kinds of practices can help to bolster our protection against some of those challenges and can help to provide alternatives and choices in those moments when we are faced with difficulties that are outside of our control. What's the mechanism by which mindfulness helps us not get owned by fixation and rumination? I think that there are two parts of that, and they're kind of held within a broader context. So the two aspects are this capacity to intentionally direct your attention. And the other is the capacity, as we were just talking about, to sort of step back, to take a seat on the bank of the river and notice the leaves moving by rather than getting pulled into the water. So those are the two specific skills that most mindfulness-based programs, specifically for mental health reasons, that they train And both of those, Dan, are held within this wider context of kindness and gentleness. And that, I think, is a really critical piece to emphasize because what I often see with people who are just learning some of these practices is that there's also a risk that they can get sort of absorbed into these habits of being really hard on ourselves. And so people can experience frustration with like, this is really hard, or I can't do this, or I sat down to practice mindfulness and I had to jump back up after two minutes because I felt so antsy or impatient or frustrated, or my mind was all over the place or challenges with, you know, just simply like, I I had intended to practice this yesterday and the day before that and the day before that. And I don't even know where the last few days went. So there can be a lot of guilt and self-recrimination, I think, as people are in the learning process. And so it's really critical to bring that attitude of kindness towards oneself in the process of learning. And that can be in a single practice session, save, or maybe the invitation is to pay attention to the sensations of breathing and you notice your attention is anywhere but on the sensations of breathing. And so bringing that quality of kindness and in noticing that that's the nature of one's mind, as well as more broadly with the intention to practice or make these practices a part of one's daily life. We can give ourselves a really hard time. And it's really important that as people are learning mindfulness practices, that they don't become just another tool by which one criticizes or judges oneself. I want to, as the kids in the office these days say, I want to double click on that because it's incredibly important in my opinion. I've mentioned this before in the show, so I apologize to everybody if I'm being repetitive, but one of the biggest developments in my contemplative career, such as it is, has been moving from a kind of clinical mindfulness, a clinical awareness where I'm noting the arising of anger or selfishness or impatience with an unseen sheen of aversion to actually welcoming it in with an attitude that was nicely summed up by the great teacher Jack Cornfield of, oh yeah, this, whatever, this aspect of my ugliness is just the organism trying to protect itself. So yes, I really agree with you. And I can hear people asking, okay, you're calling for kindness. By the way, this these calls for being kind during meditation, they washed over me for many years because it just sounded like, hey, that sounds nice, I guess, or I don't know, maybe like a public service announcement, or I don't know. But I just wasn't able to do it. I was ignoring it for any number of reasons, maybe unseen sexism, who knows. But I wasn't doing it. And then when I started to do it, my life and my practice got a lot better. However, I think a lot of people might be asking, how do I do that? How do I bring kindness in to these situations when I'm seeing the same sad or angry thoughts I've been seeing since I was, uh, you know, a kid. 
Yeah. So that experience you just said a couple minutes ago of like, I have a million things to say about (laughs) that. I'm having that now. Maybe just to like work backwards in what you're saying, because I think it's so important. There are so many sneaky ways in which these habits of self-judgment and harshness can creep in. This idea that, like, even as you said at the end, like, my practice got better. Like, that would be one I would bring even, like, curiosity to, which is, what does that mean for our practice to get better? And if something can be better, can it also be worse? And who kind of holds the yardstick for that? It is in the air and the water, this tendency to judge. And there are ways in which it's helpful, right? Like our capacity to make discriminations about what and discernment with respect to like what is helpful and what is harmful, that's a critical skill that we have as human beings. And yet when we begin to conflate that with our essential value, so that our essential value as human beings then becomes conditional on how we perform, that's a really slippery slope. And it's a place where that tendency to judge, to blame, it really can fester and grow there. So that's one piece I would say is like to notice the ways in which These value judgments can sneakily creep in to how we approach our practice and learning. You already have these skills and capacities within you. And so the practice really is about reminding yourself of these capacities that live within you. The other piece that I was reminded as you were sharing your experience in like that journey of like hearing, I I heard these, you know, be gentle with yourself and let that thought go and come back with kindness to your breath. Like I heard them as like public service advertisements, but they weren't really going in, right? And how many times we can hear these invitations or, or even guidance or recommendations to be kind with ourselves. It's like we hear them, but they kind of um, wash over us in a way. And I was reminded that I had this experience a few years ago when I was presenting at a Mind and Life event in Dharamsala in India. And I was sharing with His Holiness the Dalai Lama some of the research that I and my colleagues had been doing on, on depression and the ways in which mindfulness can help people develop protection from depression relapse. And in that case, specifically with women during pregnancy. And he said at the end of this, in sharing these data, he kind of turned to me and said, you have a very important role. And with that important role, you also have more responsibility. And then he talked about the importance of these practices and the the benefit of mental training and in one's inner state. And then he said, and I just, you know, this it was like one of those moments, right? That's like the message was so clear. And he said, from one person to 10 people to a hundred people to a thousand people to a hundred thousand people, that is the way to change humanity's way of life. And I heard that in that meeting and I thought about it, you know, for weeks and months after that, after I came back to Boulder and continued to do the work I was doing. And for the longest time, I heard that guidance as connected to a lot of the research that I have been doing around how can we increase access. And I thought his message is to say, You start with one person with these kinds of programs, and you find a way to increase the scale and reach of these programs so that they are available to hundreds of thousands of people, right? And then there was this moment when I realized that there was another way to hear that. And the other way to hear what he had said was that it wasn't just about the work that I or others could do in the world, that it also was that I am one of the one. If we're starting from one and we're going to 100,000, we can't forget that 
we are also one of the one. So in this story that you shared, Dan, if part of the message that you're sharing with the world is around the importance of kindness and gentleness with oneself, it's a reminder that we also are one of the one for practicing that. So I thought about that experience and that guidance from him many months before I made that connection. I'm one of the one. I need to bring these practices into my own life and to remember that in a way that's really deep and authentic if I'm to have any benefit when I look outward to the 100,000. So so you're also not alone in like hearing frequently, often and powerfully important reminders and kind of needing to learn it again and again. You know, I've been doing this work for many years and that reminder towards self-compassion and kindness with oneself is a daily practice for sure. How to do it though? How do we make this practical and not just some sort of platitude that washes over people? Well, I think that there are a couple of ways we can do that. I do think intention is a really powerful force. I think simple, brief practices like clarifying, setting an intention for the day. So one of the teachers, I think, who is part of the 10% Happier community, Sharon Salzberg, has beautiful practices. And she actually recorded the mindfulness and compassion practices that we used in the study that we did with women during pregnancy and the postpartum. And so some of those practices are formal loving kindness practices where you work with the repetition of phrases like, may I be well in that study, may my baby be well, may my baby be filled with loving kindness, may I be filled with loving kindness. So we can dedicate specific times, five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes on a regular basis to doing practices like that led by teachers like Sharon. The great thing about that is that when we're in moments that are more challenging, they're available to us. They're there as resources and support. So I have, you know, for all of my life, despite all of the kind of public speaking and podcasts and teaching that I do, had an intense fear of public speaking. And so even though I've learned to work with that in many ways over time, I still, before this conversation, I can feel those sensations of um, fear and anxiety arising. So when we had those 30 seconds at the start, the first thing that came to me was Sharon's voice in some of those audio guided practices. So that what was available was, may I be well? May you be well, Dan, and may this work have benefit. That's just one example of something that literally took 30 seconds. We were going to do this 30 seconds anyway. It wasn't carving out any additional time, but it was bringing that skill of mindfulness to noticing what am I feeling in this moment? What's present in my experience? And then responding to that with some of these tools that are about self-kindness kindness for others, and an intention to be of benefit in the world. Much more of my conversation with Sona Demidjian right after this. Okay, 2023 is here. Now it's time to start your healthy resolution. But taking that first step can be a little tricky. Like, wait, which vitamins do I need for my diet? And how do I know which supplements are the right fit for me? That's why Walgreens is here with an easy-to-use vitamin selector tool to help you find, order, and get immunity, health, multivitamins, and more delivered right to your door. So you get out there and make this year your best year yet. Vitamin selector tool is not intended to diagnose or treat any conditions. In business, competition is the key to success. Every product you own, from the shoes on your feet to the phone in your hands, got there because of cutthroat business decisions. And Wondery's podcast, Business Wars, brings you stories about the most well-known companies in the world and how the decisions they make shape what you buy and how you live. 
With over 50 seasons to choose from, you'll hear about the fight for your feet with Nike versus Adidas, the battle to control the smartphone market with iPhone versus BlackBerry, or the game-changing company that is Tesla and Elon Musk's bid to take on the entire auto industry. Business Wars covers every sector from fashion to food, tech to travel, sports to pop culture, and more. These stories are entertaining, fun, eye-opening, and will help you understand a little bit more about the world around you. Follow Business Wars wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. So if people have heard you talk about using mindfulness to not get hung up in fixation or rumination, whether you have a tendency toward depression or not, if people heard you talk about that and heard your exhortation to view whatever's coming up with some level of kindness, the answer to how do I actually do that, Sona Dimijin, is, well, there are practices designed to boost your capacity to do that. They're sometimes known by the rather grandiose title of the divine abodes or the Brahma Viharas, and, and they include skills such as loving kindness or friendliness, also compassion. And Sharon Salzberg, who you mentioned, is really, I would say, the principal proponent in the West of these practices, can turn up the dial on the warmth in our own practice. And everything I'm describing, I've seen for myself, Mm -hmm. for sure. But am I summarizing you correctly? You are summarizing me correctly. And the piece I would add to what you're saying is that we have evidence from rigorously designed and conducted research studies that attest to the fact that doing those practices and learning those skills for many people can provide benefit in the moment and also enduring benefit for studies where we have continued to stay in touch with people and to learn from them about the extent to which these benefits persist for up to a year after doing a course where they have learned some of these core practices. Even if they're not doing the practices anymore. Well, what's interesting is, so in some of the work that we did with women during pregnancy was that we found that in an eight-week program where they participated two hours per week in the class, and were asked to practice on a daily basis. On average, women reported that they practiced for about 15 minutes, three times a week. So in that study, over that eight-week period, that's their context for learning and practice. On average, to attend two hours a week for eight weeks, and then to practice about 15 minutes, three times a week they were significantly protected from the return of depression throughout their entire pregnancy and up to six months postpartum. In another study that we did with adults in the general population, so this is 460 adults who had histories of depression, were not currently in an episode of depression, but had residual symptoms. So like their depression had lingered. They participated in an eight-session program that my colleague Zendel Siegel and I developed called Mindful Mood Balance that was delivered all digitally. So an eight-session program, they had 12 weeks in which they could complete it. And it was with people in that study that we compared the impact on depression and anxiety relative to what was the usual care pathway within the Kaiser permanente system here in Colorado. And we found that those significant benefits in terms of the reduction of their residual depressive symptoms, that those also persisted for an entire year, that benefit after the course of learning this mindful mood balance program over the course of 12 weeks. And interestingly, Dan, we also have some data that are under review that we've been looking at, which is a a secondary analysis. So the study wasn't planned to do this, but it 
addresses, I think, an important question, which is what about people for whom not just depression, but also thoughts of suicide or suicidal behaviors are part of their experience or their history? What is this digital platform of mindful mood balance? What is the benefit for them? And by the end of that 12-week period, what we found is that there were significant benefits for the people who did the Mindful Mood Balance program compared to usual care in both the extent to which people reported any suicidal ideation, so as well as people who were in the uh, what we called the high suicidal ideation group was only 10% of people in the Mindful Mood Balance Program relative to almost a quarter of people in the usual care group. So I think these data are important because they are indicators that these practices are powerful and they also can be enduring in their benefit. And it is possible to both learn and practice in a way that can be integrated in the part of regular daily life. The first practice that we do in the Mindful Mood Balance Program is mindful eating, is bringing these qualities of awareness and kindness that we've been talking about to Something that you do multiple times a day that doesn't require planning, scheduling, doing anything different than what's already happening in the ebb and flow of daily life. I just want to be clear about something. This eight or 12 week program, you're saying there are enduring benefits for people who just do the program and stop practicing when the program's over. There are benefits you see months later. We have focused most on characterizing the practice that people do during the program period, less so during the follow-up period. But that gives you an indicator of the extent to which people are practicing during the program period. You don't know, though, whether the, the folks who are seeing the enduring benefit, if there's any correlation to whether they're continuing to practice. Yeah, it's that's a great question. We do know that there's a correlation between the extent to which people practice during the program period, the eight or the 12 weeks, depending on the studies. There is an association there. For the Mindful Mood Balance Program, like the number of sessions that people complete in the program is associated with the benefit that they receive. We haven't looked at associations in the follow-up windows. So you've described a couple of programs that you teach, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, Mm -hmm. MBCT, and then also mindful mood mood balance. balance. What is the difference between what you're teaching in these programs, these eight or 12-week programs, and what the rank-and-file meditator who uses an app or who basically knows the beginning instructions and practices for 5, 10, 15 minutes most days or as many days as they can muster. What's the difference between, you know, a regular meditator and what the folks are getting in MBCT or the Mood Balance Program? Yeah, that's a great question. So the Mindful Mood Balance Program, which is essentially a a digital version of what you would experience if you were in a mindfulness-based cognitive therapy in-person class. One of the reasons that we did that was because the availability of those classes is so limited and there are so many barriers for people to accessing those. And and actually the idea for developing that digital program came when Zindel and I, you know, the, the sort of gold standard for instructors of MBCT in their learning is to participate in a five day residential immersion training where you both go through the whole program and then you teach it with feedback and opportunity for practice. We were um, leading one of these residential trainings in Joshua Tree and kind of looking out at this beautiful scenery and these long days of, you know, practice and learning that we had with a group of people who wanted to learn to be facilitators and realized both that it was, you know, an incredible experience and privilege to do that kind of work and that if we actually wanted to 
have the capacity to bring benefit to the lives of the literally hundreds of millions of people around the world who struggle with depression, that was not the way to do it. And so that led to thinking about how can we bring the exact same kind of learning experience in a digital format. And so where it differs, I think, from some of the other kinds of mindfulness programs that are available to people is that it's a synthesis of expertise in both the teaching and the practice of mindfulness with what do we know about depression and the territory of depression and what I think of as like depression's close cousins, anxiety and stress, and what are some of the most well-supported with really good science, strategies also from cognitive and behavioral therapy. And what the Mindful Mood Balance Program does is it's it's an integration of these different streams of knowledge and skill. And I think that integration is really critical. The other piece is that there's a very intentional arc of learning in the Mindful Mood Balance Program, which again is rooted in MBCT, that moves along a very clear sort of gradient of attention, starting with ways to strengthen the capacity to focus attention in places that are more based in the body and that are more neutral. So like we were just talking about eating, but then moves over time in a systematic kind of arc towards the kinds of thoughts and emotions and situations that are most difficult and painful and likely to trigger an episode of depression for people. And so the sequence, I guess I would say, within the program to build in a kind of systematic way that scaffolds people so that you're not just kind of thrown into the deep end in the places where you're most vulnerable, but you're also not, you're not avoiding those either. So that kind of systematic progression that's informed by a deep understanding of the ways in which people can be and are vulnerable to depression and stress and anxiety, I think is really important. The other piece is that we design the program in a way that you have the experience of participating as part of a group of people who also are learning with you. All the learning starts with your own experience. So it's really learning through doing. So every component starts with a guided practice and the opportunity to learn from your own experience. But then to also be able to access other people's experiences by listening and watching videos of other people who have learned the same practices, who can talk about the challenges and the, you know, opportunities and benefits that they've experienced. So, and I think that sense of being part of a community of people is a really critical aspect of learning mindfulness and self-compassion practices and also specifically bringing them into spaces like depression, anxiety. Because again, to go back to our earlier conversation, there's so much stigma and there's so much guilt and shame that those spaces can be really isolating for people. How do I know whether... I need something like MBCT or mindful mood balance because I think a lot of us, I mean, I've had episodes of depression since I was a child and then I maybe get a flavor of it for a few days now and again. That's me, but I think a lot of other people maybe just get sad once in a while and, you know, we see a therapist and or we do a little bit of meditation and or we aspire to do either of the above. (laughs) How do you decide what lever to actually pull? So what you're describing about the experience of depression in your own life, Dan, is very much what most people who have experienced depression, how they might describe like this, um, they may experience an episode of depression, that there are times in life when it really recedes, you know, it's not part of one's daily life. And then there are times when it comes back. And then for some people, there are aspects, there are, um, that's when we talk about residual depression symptoms, 
that what we mean is that you may not be in a full episode of depression, but there are some elements and it could be the sadness or a lack of interest that persists, but at a lower level. It could be some of the thoughts that we've been talking about, thoughts of one's own inadequacy or deficiencies. It could be challenges with concentration. As I was talking about earlier, for some people, thoughts of um, suicide that can persist. The places where we have studied and others have studied programs like mindful mood balance or mindfulness-based cognitive therapy have been mostly with people who are not in an acute episode of depression. So are not in the kind of intensity of the depth of the suffering of an acute episode of depression, but are in those in-between times that you're describing. So people who have experienced prior episodes of depression, who may be having some lingering symptoms, but have the, the sort of resources in the moment to engage in a program like this and to like the inner resources of energy and concentration that are available to them. Those inner resources are can be very depleted when one is in a full episode of depression. And a lot of the other research that I have done has really focused on what do people need when they're in the depth of that, those times of depression. And, and those skills can work in concert with the kind of mindfulness and self-compassion skills we're talking about now. But when you are in an acute episode of depression, the skills that I think are more critical to those times are skills that focus on action. They're skills that focus on engaging with the world around you and countering the tendency to avoid and withdraw. And so there's a connection between, I think, using the skills of action and engagement during episodes of depression that help reconnect people with sources of enjoyment and reward and relationships in their lives. And then these other skills that we've been talking about, the skills that focus on how to work with your mind skillfully, those I think can be particularly helpful in preventing episodes of depression from returning. Does that make sense? It does, I think. So when, if you're in the depths of depression, you, you might not have the mental resources such as concentration required to do MBCT or any other sort of mindfulness-based therapy. So instead, you recommend engaging with the world. By that, are you referring to like volunteerism? The answer to that question of what do I recommend is very individualized. And so for some people, like, Engaging in volunteer activities might be exactly the thing that would be helpful for them. For some people, even the thought of that would drive them more deeply into withdrawal or avoidance from the world around them because we each differ in what it is that is rewarding, that keeps us engaged and active in our lives. And so where I was saying these skills, they do have a relationship with each other. So the approach that I and others have studied most widely as a robust approach for treating and managing depression is an approach called behavioral activation. And that begins with noticing, and times when people are experiencing depression, noticing the connections between what do you do and how do you feel. And so that's also a place where mindfulness shows up. It's not meditation, but it is awareness. It's noticing on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour, in some cases, basis, what are you doing and how are you feeling? And what are the connections? So that what we begin to do with that approach is by bringing our awareness to what are the activities that are part of your daily life, And we're looking for the ingredients of a behavioral antidepressant in that case. And so for me, the activities that would make up my personalized behavioral antidepressant might be really different than the ones that you might end up with. And that's why it's really important to start with that process of paying attention What are the activities that bring me a sense of accomplishment, that bring me a sense of connecting with other people, a sense of 
enjoyment, and then to begin with support so that you're not alone in this process with support of starting to structure and schedule those into your daily routine in a way that is systematic and tuned to like, where is it feasible for you to start so that you're also not overwhelming yourself with trying to do too much too soon. Out of curiosity, what would be on your BA behavioral activation list? What would be on the list of things you would do to kind of pull yourself out of the depths of depression? For me personally? Yeah. So I have, I don't know if I could find it right in this moment, but I have on my computer a list that I created when I was in my early 20s. It's still the same list. And that was in the context of experiencing depression after a client in the clinic where I worked early in my career died by suicide. And that was one of those kind of crucible times in life that helped me develop awareness of exactly what you're asking, which is like, what's on my list? And also really powerfully fueled for me the commitment to go to graduate school and to focus on doing research that would ensure that like the best of what science can offer in terms of how to care for people's mental health that we were doing the best science we could and that we were making sure that science was available for every person who needed it, no matter where they lived and what kind of resources they had access to. So my list at that point would be the same list I have now, which is being in nature is a really important one for me. Exercise, running or hiking, walking, cooking, spending time with close friends and family, reading. And then another one for me is work, meaningful work that offers meaning and benefit to other people. What's on your list, (laughs) Anne? Well, I was going to say many of the same things. My son and I, who's seven, my son and I recently invested in a great antidepressant, which is called a drum set. And that's been great for both of us. Not that I don't think he is depressed that I can tell, but it's a really fun thing to do individually and together. And if I had to put my finger on a potential common denominator among all the things on your list and probably among all the things I would list, is it kind of gets you out of your own head. There's a self-involvement with depression that kind of points to a, a happiness fallacy, which is that like if we we want to get happy, we need to start thinking about ourselves a lot, but actually thinking about yourself is generally not the best route toward happiness. Yeah, I mean, that takes us back to sort of some of the early topics we were exploring around rumination. And that narrative mode of the mind can often be very self-focused in ways that are also very negative. And so those kinds of activities that help support us being engaged in the world around us are really critical. And I love that you're doing the drumming with your son because that will always be a resource for him. Like he will have that knowing, not just as a kind of mental thing. Like I used to play the drums with my dad and it was super fun and we laughed and You know, but like that will live in his body, that experience of enjoyment and connection. And so these kinds of activities of like ways in which we can stay engaged with the world, that we have those in our histories we can draw from, or we have people in our lives right now who can help support us in developing them. Because when people are experiencing depression, that's that every fiber of your being is pulling away from that. The the gravitational force towards withdrawing and isolating and avoiding is so powerful. When we talk about lists and these activities, the awareness we can develop, I always want to balance that with just really clearly saying like, we can't take a kind of like Nike, like just do it, just get out there and play the drums when you're feeling down. Because although that can sound like a simple thing to do in the moment when someone's experiencing depression, that can be a Herculean effort. 
So both are true. Like it's simple and it's powerful and it's essential and it can be really hard. Much more of my conversation with Sona Demidjian right after this. The world is full of inspiring people who've achieved unimaginable feats. Some have scaled the tallest mountains. Others have created music beloved by millions of people. Whose Amazing Life is a podcast from Wondery that celebrates these one in a million stories. Each episode walks you through the life's journey of a legend in their field. They could be an athlete, an artist, an explorer, an actor, anyone who made an impact on the world around us. But here's the catch. You won't know who we're describing until the very end of the episode. So it's your job to play along. From the creators of Little Stories Everywhere and Adventures of Cairo, Whose Amazing Life is a podcast for the whole family that allows you to spend some time walking in the shoes of legends. Listen to the clues and do your best to immerse yourself in the life of someone amazing. Follow Whose Amazing Life wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app. Some of the hardest moments of my life are when I've been deep in depression and forcing myself to exercise when that flu-like ache that often comes with depression and it feels so wrong to exercise, but I know it'll make me feel better. And that's just a tough moment for me. What's your take on antidepressants? She's smiling like she's going to say something. Mr. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting because I was just uh, emailing with a colleague, Jay Fournier, who's a great depression researcher um, who was the senior author on a paper that we and a group of researchers published in 2010. I emailed him and said, when you share these data, you know, it's over a decade later, like, are you qualifying this in any sort of way? Because I think these points are still as relevant today as they were over a decade ago. And he said, not really. I agree. Like these findings are still important and relevant. So the essence of that study, which was what's called an individual participant level meta-analysis, which pooled the data from multiple studies that looked at differences between antidepressant medication and placebo and for adults with depression. And what was really interesting about that was that if we took all the people, pulled from all the studies, if you ordered people in terms of the severity of their depression at the beginning of the study, it was only among the most severe category that there was a significant difference that has been determined by other guidelines as a meaningful difference between the antidepressant medication and placebo. So that doesn't mean that the medication wasn't effective for the, all the rest of the people. It just wasn't significantly more effective than taking a placebo. So that suggests the, the specific efficacy of antidepressant medication is limited to that group of people. What that suggests is like there is, those data would indicate that there is specific value and benefit to antidepressant medication and that the vast majority of people in those studies got the same benefit from a placebo which are findings that have been available now for over a decade and that, at least as far as I can see, haven't dramatically influenced the kind of mental health care that's available or treatment guidelines. What's going on there? I think it's an example of the way in which we, as scientists and, you know, our world generally, we haven't developed effective ways at communicating important scientific findings in a way that has broad access. And so I think there's more work to do there. I think the decision about whether or not to take an antidepressant is what that means for any given individual is a decision that that individual and their healthcare provider need to make. And it's important to know about these kinds of research findings that are available. I think the other really important point about 
what we know about how antidepressant medications work and how they don't is that, and this is very relevant to the kinds of training and skills that we've been talking about in terms of staying well over the long term and preventing relapse of depression is the evidence is very clear. And we've done studies, many people have done studies that speak to this, is that regardless of how the benefit is provided, whether or not it's actually something specific to the pharmacological agent or it's the placebo effect of expectancies and doing something every day, taking a medication, that that benefit persists only as long as people are continuing to take the medication. And so we don't see enduring benefits once people have stopped taking an antidepressant. This is in contrast to programs like Mindful Mood Balance or MBCT or other mindfulness-based programs where we see benefit even after the, the you know, program window has ended and people are no longer attending those classes, that there's some kind of learning that happens that stays with you in a way that whatever benefits antidepressant medication offers doesn't stay with you in the same kind of way once you have stopped taking that medication. How do MBCT at all stack up against pharmacological interventions in terms of benefit in the moment? While people are taking them? Yes, while people are either taking the medicine or doing the course. Is your stuff better than a placebo? Yeah, so my colleague Zendel Siegel's probably done the most direct tests of the question that you're asking and has found specific benefits relative to placebo, particularly among people who have what his group described as like unstable periods of remission. So people for whom their depression had improved, but it was kind of up and down, that for that group in particular, there were benefits to MBCT, um, which, you know, again, gives us some important evidence that it's more than just the ingredients that go with placebo, which most people emphasize the the power of expectancy, doing something that you think will have an impact. So we've seen that in the study that Zindel and his colleagues did. We also, this was a compassion-based intervention that was just for the general population, not specifically tied to mental health. But my colleague, Tor Wager, and her graduate student, Yoni Ashar, who's, who's no longer a graduate student, is a um, researcher in his own right in the world now. And then another colleague, Jess Andrews Hanna, did this really interesting study, speaking of placebo, with a compassion meditation that was uh, four different compassion meditation practices that people were asked to do over a four-week period that Roshi Joan Halifax created and recorded. And this was in a study where we asked adults to participate, to do something that would increase compassion for others in the world. And so we were interested in the extent to which this compassion meditation training would have those effects. But we also wanted to answer the question you're asking, which is like, does it work in any specific ways that are over and above just asking people to do something that would make them more compassionate. So Tor has had decades of experience studying placebo effects in pain. He had the idea to create this compassion placebo, which was we gave people nasal spray that we told them was oxytocin. And that if they sprayed it in their nose every day for four weeks, it would change their brain in a way that would make them more compassionate. And it, it was a saline solution, so it had nothing active in it. And in that study, what was interesting was that we did find specific effects of the compassion intervention over and above the nasal spray oxytocin placebo. And we included a condition where people basically just listened to stories and looked at images of people who were suffering over time without giving them anything to do in response to those. And we actually found one of the largest differences was between the compassion intervention in that group 
with respect to the amount that people were willing to donate money that we gave to people in the study. And that people in that group actually were less generous by the end of the study than they were at the beginning, which we wondered if was in part a function of asking people to be in the presence of suffering others over and over again without giving them any tools or training for how to respond to that and how to take action in response to that, which is also a place that I think people are in on a routine and daily basis in our lives right now with the kind of events in our world and exposure through different forms of media. So I think it raises some really interesting questions about also the importance of compassion meditation as a protective practice for our connection as human beings in our world today. You've raised innumerable fascinating questions over the course of this conversation. Uh, I see that our time here is kind of drawing to a close, but let me just ask you quickly, can you just plug your books and and where you are on the internet and any programs you're offering just for people who want to learn more? So I think for people who are interested in learning more about some of the programs that I've described, my colleague Zindel Siegel and I actually founded a company last year called Mindful Noggin that's sole intent is to make more widely available some of the skills and practices that we've talked about today. So the Mindful Mood Balance Program, another related program called the Three Minute Breathing Space, which is a kind of core practice that is intended to be brief and transportable in everyday life are available there. My colleague Cheryl Goodman and I wrote a book, Expecting Mindfully, that is brings these practices specifically in work that we've done with women during pregnancy and early parenting. And that really focuses on how learning the skills of mindfulness and self-compassion can be critical for one's own mental health as a new and expectant mom and can help to establish a foundation for the transition to parenthood and family life in really important ways. So those are a couple of places to learn more. And then, um, you know, as the director of the Crown Institute at the University of Colorado Boulder, we are continuing to study and to co-create with young people and families and teachers, ways in which practices like mindfulness and self-compassion and compassion can bring benefit in people's everyday lives. And so I would also say like, stay connected with the research that we're doing and the findings because there are a lot of exciting studies that are just getting started that are underway and that will be yielding some important discoveries soon. Sona, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Thanks again to Sona. And thanks, of course, to everybody who makes this show. Samuel Johns, Gabrielle Zuckerman, DJ Kashmir, Justine Davey, Kim Baikama, Maria Wortel, and Jen Poyant. And we get our audio engineering from the good folks over at Ultraviolet Audio. We'll see you on Friday for a bonus. Hey, hey, Prime members, you can listen to 10% Happier early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen early and ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, do us a solid and tell us all about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. However you want to make a splash this year, Wool Runner Mizzles from Allbirds can help every step of the way. Wool Runner Mizzles are shoes crafted with premium, supernatural, weather-repellent materials. The high-top uppers are moisture-wicking merino wool with puddle guard technology, and the supernatural rubber treads ensure all-weather traction, so you can jump into anything, rain or shine. Make a splash with Wool Runner Mizzles from Allbirds. Discover your perfect pair at allbirds.com today. That's A-L-L-B-I-R-D-S dot com.